passwords. We all use them to secure loads of our accounts. And we might have, we probably have lots of different passwords for lots of different things. Something that is you no know, good for protecting us, but it can be hard to remember all these passwords. That means sometimes people do take shortcuts and use the same password for multiple accounts. While that's easier for us to remember, it does make things easier for cyber criminals to breach our accounts for both our personal lives and for perhaps our corporate lives. So what is the problem with passwords and how can we try and fix them so they're better for everyone? I'm Danny Palmer. This is ZDNet Security Update. And with me to discuss passwords is Wolfgang Goelick, advisory CISO at Cisco Geosecurity. Thanks for joining me, Wolfgang. So first of all, can you give me a bit of a history lesson here? How, how did passwords become the dominant way to secure our accounts? Yeah, certainly. One of the interesting things about the history of passwords is right away, I mean, within months, users rebelled. Right away, <laughs> within less than a year, there was a security breach. Uh, it happened about six decades ago, the 1960s. They originated on an IBM uh, 7094 mainframe, which uh, is, is a quite a bit of dated tech. And they were implemented for accounting for a university, for MIT. So we knew who was getting in and who was using computing time. And as I mentioned very quickly, the students rebelled and started printing them off, handing them out round, uh, compromising the password file. Uh, a couple of years after that, someone switched the password file with the message of the day file. So everyone who logged in would see everybody's passwords. So needless to say, this, this little shared secret, the string of text that uh, protects all our accounts, that is often the first and last line of defense, uh, got off to a rocky start and really didn't get much better in the preceding six decades. Like many uh, issues in technology, it seems that, yeah, this is something which has been a problem for a long time, you know, designed for a a period of time where you know not everyone was online. You know, back then, you know, th th these computer systems were only in universities and NASA and you no know, military maybe. But now, you know, as you've moved through time into the 90s, 2000s, uh, and now, you know, everyone has passwords for everything. But the process of actually using passwords hasn't really changed. And you, know, you often see you know lists of commonly used passwords and. Your usual suspects are, are up there with you know, some extremely common passwords, which are really easy to uh, breach. Yeah, the uh, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that we've seen as passwords moved out of the university is it's no longer the case where we only have one application or one computer. Uh, a typical person in the workforce will have anywhere from two to six devices they use. A typical person in the workforce will have around 191 passwords that they use for the enterprise applications. So the advice is great, right? Use a long password, use a password phrase, mix in special characters, change them often. This is good advice when you've got one password, maybe when you've got 10. When you get into the several hundreds, it doesn't scale either cognitively or just from a matter of practicality. It's definitely a tricky one. There's certainly been times where I've uh, tried to log into one of my accounts. I've you know, forgotten the password because you know, I've tried to you know, use a you know, yeah, long, extensive, random thing. And then I can't remember it in the first place. Find out I get locked out of the account and go, OK, I'll put this password in. Then it says, you have used that password already. And it's just, it's, uh, so it's easy, it's easy to see why people um, take shortcuts, I suppose, because Ultimately, they want to be able to get into their, their accounts as soon as possible because you know, people need this for product productivity at work, for example. If you're spending half your day trying to remember your password, you're not getting anything done. But it does also leave doors open for other people, you know, let's cyber criminals, for example, to access these accounts as well. Absolutely. And the, the nature of, of passwords really points to something that is fundamental to security. Uh, our jobs as security professionals is, is to protect the individual, to protect the organization, to protect the data. And in doing those jobs, we really have two fundamental moves. We either make it harder on the machine, which we've seen with passwordless in terms of better storage, uh, you know, encrypting the passwords, salting the passwords, those types of things. 
Uh, or we make it harder on the user, which we see with demanding longer passwords and rotation and everything. Uh, whenever we make it harder on the user, the, the idea of, oh, well, it's, everyone will adapt, you know, you'll get to be more street smart as everyone's online, you'll figure it out. I think that is, is a quaint idea in today's reality, because as we've seen over the decades, uh, humans are fairly consistent and we need to get things done. And when the security is in the way of us getting those things done, we're gonna work around it. And that seems to be the case uh, when it comes particularly to things like cloud applications. A lot of people have been using more over the last 18 months. Now, a lot of us have had to work from home and a lot of people have you know, have using these cloud services rather than you know, the applications are on their desktop. They've got these and things like Microsoft, Microsoft Office 365 which is good. So it allows them to be productive you know, in, in their own homes using their own device. But you know, these are secured with uh, passwords and usernames and passwords. And the problem is if that's a simple username and password and that is breached, uh, that could potentially have big consequences because that could not only allow uh, sort of threat actors into you know, seeing your Word documents, for example, that's the same password for your email, same password for you know, sharing uh, work with your colleagues. And it can be a an entry point into the networks. And we have seen over the course of the last year or so, uh, attackers have been uh, targeting these sorts of things because things like uh, insecure passwords, uh, which people are using because they want to be more efficient, they want to do their jobs, have arguably made things slightly easier, unfortunately. Yeah, the Verizon data breach report, right? The, the quintessential report for our industry in terms of what the adversaries are doing and, and how they're going about it. The Verizon data breach report put the number uh, just shy of 85%. 85% of the security incidents in the data set for last year uh, relied on the human element, which was fundamentally people making mistakes and criminals taking advantage of those mistakes, usually weak passwords, usually poor secrets management, criminals taking advantage of those mistakes to, to access sensitive data and to breach systems. So I, I mentioned earlier, it's, it's the, the first line of defense, right? That's the first security control we oftentimes see. We authenticate, we log in, uh, and we get ready to go. But unfortunately, without good defense in depth, without asking more of the machine, it does become that last line of defense. And when a password is breached, is shared, is guessed, is brute forced, uh, when the password is available to the adversary, that can allow them to get to all sorts of sensitive data. And as we've seen, especially over the course of the last few months, there's been a number of incidents like the, the various ransomware attacks that have happened over the course of the last few months in particular. And in a lot of these cases, it does seem that it has been a, a weak password or you no know, default credentials that have allowed a, a, attackers in, you know, just demonstrating how important it is to make sure that uh, you know, the password isn't the only line of defense. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the nature of these credentials make it very easy to get wrong. And so when I start thinking about how we can demand more of the machine, right, in ways that is invisible to the user, I start thinking about those, those trust controls. Uh, is the person on a device we've seen before? Uh, are they coming in the time that we've seen before? Uh, are they accessing applications that they should? Or are they coming in from uh, another country we've never seen, uh, on a device we've never seen? Are they trying to download a whole bunch of sensitive information? We need to uh, instrument and put in place telemetry across all those various steps so we can really make better decisions other than just extending trust if you've got this password. That's the thing. It seems that at the moment, you know, someone can access an account from potentially the other side of the world. And the way some systems are built, because you know, a lot of these systems are still operating in the way they were, they were designed to operate in the, let's say, early 90s, for example, where there, was, uh, there were still threats around, but they were much less common. Now, you can have you know, so many different threats coming in almost all the time. And if you know, your company ends up with that data dumped in a breach somewhere and you might not even know, that's going to be a field day for, for cyber criminals. And a recent report suggested that you know, if, if, you, if passwords appear online, attackers will start trying to use them you know, within 12 hours, uh, if that. And so it's important to uh, 
to build other defenses around it as well. And things like multi-factor authentication, for example, is something that you know, a lot of uh, security experts will say it's very helpful. You, know, you use this because it can protect against um, a figure that is often said 99% of uh, attacks. But it's again, one of those things where we see that when there's a major breach, it often turns out that this wasn't applied to that network. So there's, and it comes down to the uh, ease of use uh, factor again, because you know, having to log into a multi-factor authentication app you know, every 15 minutes or so is not ideal for uh, productivity. The, uh, the amount of attacks is just staggering. We did a, at Cisco, we did a CISO benchmark study about a year ago, and we found that over half of the organizations were reporting 10,000 alerts that their security operations team were handling uh, on a daily basis. So it's 10,000 alerts, 10,000 combination of signals and actions that you know were suspicious enough to, to be alerted on a day. When you put on devices with default passwords, there's been studies done on this that uh, within less than an hour, sometimes within minutes, they'll get compromised because people are scanning and using automated tools to leverage these default accounts, to leverage the accounts that get breached. So yeah, the, the often uh, used approach to this is multi-factor, which makes sense. Uh, we are going to replace a easy to guess, easy to steal password, or rather not replace, but supplement. Uh, easy to guess, easy to steal password with a gesture, um, with a token we have, with a, uh, you know, a security key. And there's several different ways to do these. And back to my point earlier, uh, we either can demand more of the machine, very sophisticated, uh, you know, encryption algorithms and one-time passwords, or it can demand more of the user. Okay, we're going to send you a code and you got to type that code in and uh, that's going to slow you down. Uh, please don't, please don't mind that your productivity is being impacted. We're from security, we're doing what's best for you. I think organizations that have been successful with multi-factor have greatly reduced the account takeovers of from brute force or reused passwords and have done so in a way that hasn't demanded much from the user, has been um, using easier to, to use factors, has been using a combination of that with device trust where I can remember uh, myself on this device for a period of time, so I'm not being prompted every 15 minutes. Uh, I think the organizations that are successful in combining password or passwords with strong factor do so in a way that still recognizes the humanity and, and makes it easier on the end user. The end user making it easy for the end user is no one of the key points here because a lot sometimes the end user you know, perhaps unfairly gets blamed for incidents when if you are dealing with you know so many emails coming in a day you have so many different accounts to manage it can be uh, easy to you know, repeat passwords or you know, uh, you know, perhaps you know, click a phishing link and you know, type in your password and, and give it to someone by accident. So, so when it comes to the you know, avoiding uh, this sort of thing, uh, some, there has been talk of you know, you, a passwordless future. So what is this and how, how would it work? And is it, is it feasible? So if we think about the history, we, we started off with passwords. No one liked that. That wasn't good. <laughs> we, we added stronger factors and there can be some friction depending on how that's been deployed, but adversaries certainly don't like it. With passwordless, we recognize that you no longer even need that password, right? So if you think about today's authentication, multi-factor authentication as a shared secret, the type of text that I know in the app knows uh, and a strong factor, what passwordless is, is it's removing that password. We're still reliant upon that strong factor, which is one of the strongest ways to authenticate, but we don't need that password at all. And in doing so, that takes a lot of the burden off the end user. Now I just need to authenticate with my email address. I need to perform a gesture or you know, look at my computer or use my fingerprint uh, to unlock the uh, security key and, and I'm in. So there's fewer uh, steps for the user. It's much easier, it's much faster. There's fewer things to remember. And what's really critical about this is that it's phishing resistant because you mentioned phishing, right? It's not only people reusing passwords, it's also people getting tricked by their email. 
which is so incredibly easy to do. I would challenge any security professional who's beating their chest about the users being the problem uh, to, to admit that they've been fished at least once. We all have, it just happens. So it's phishing resistant in that, should I click on a link, should I go to something, the key that I'm unlocking recognizes that that's not the real application. The we're machine itself, again, we're putting more load on the computer. The machine itself recognizes, wait a minute, you think you're going to Google, that's not Google, I'm not gonna give out the password. So we're also adding better guide rails to this authentication to protect users in addition to simplifying it. And the combination of that makes it much harder to attack from a criminal perspective. So I suppose to sum up here, what are some of the things that both users and organizations can do to you know, help make their you know, passwords better now, or at least do things that make uh, their systems stronger and more resistant to attacks. So even if, for example, you know, a password is compromised or there's a phishing incident, that it, isn't, it doesn't result in a, in a massive uh, breach of the entire organization. The, the four steps I would recommend is first off, putting in place that strong multi-factor. We know passwords are a problem. Let's put that multi-factor in place and uh, begin to develop muscle memory acceptance within the organization for doing strong factor authentication. The second thing is to consolidate all our applications. If, uh, if people have 191 passwords they're maintaining, if organizations have around 1400 applications that they're providing, uh, maintaining all those individually is a lot of work, a lot of overhead. Uh, it creates gaps in how things are provisioned and deprovisioned, and it creates a lot of workload on the end users and the administrators. So we want to consolidate all those and provide those over single sign-on. That also is a big user benefit because now I'm not having to authenticate again and again and again. So good, strong multi-factor, consolidate your applications, Third thing would be to add that trust factors. And I mentioned earlier, looking at the context and conditions of authentication to make sure it really is the person and to reject any suspicious authentications. Now that we've got all that in place, I've got a strong factor I can rely on. I've got a central view of my applications. I've got telemetry that uh, allows me to reduce risk of authentications and, and do some experiments. At that point in time, that's the right time to approach adopting these passwordless authentication mechanisms to replace that password with a single or multiple uh, strong factor authentication. So those are the four steps that I would take. Multi-factor, single sign-on, adding trust, and then moving to adopt passwordless. That's some really good advice, Wolfgang. Hopefully that's going to be useful for anyone watching this uh, episode of ZDNet Security Update. Uh, thanks for joining me. And for more information on how to keep your network secure from cyber attacks, uh, of course, like and subscribe to the ZDNet YouTube channel. And there's plenty more news and features on ZDNet.com. Thanks for watching.